posted on social media. We're also going to be going over stuff for our competition, you know, next week. So super useful stuff. Picture of the day. You already know what it is. Coach Doran. I couldn't put the other picture on there because <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. So if you're not in person, use the sign-in form QR code. If you didn't get signed in, use that as well. But I think everybody should get signed, should have got signed in. Give it about three more seconds for everybody else on Zoom. And then we'll start with a Kahoot. Very short Kahoot today because I asked for it to be short. So here's the code for the Kahoot. And Luke will get us going. Yes, sir. I did not make the questions for anybody watching or anything because <laughs> one of these questions is my favorite question we're going to have this semester. It's hot and night simple. So we got 16 on Zoom, probably 30 ish in per person. So that means about 40. Let's look at that rip. I had a buddy that missed going out to the Duke game where we beat um, beat them by 22 two years ago and missed the Clemson game yesterday. Actually, I have two buddies that were that way. I feel so bad. That was me. Tim Beck. <laughs> yes. All right. Anybody else trying to get in? So, this, yeah, well, I'll, we'll pop it up in a second after the coup. Is that cool? All right, last call. Anybody else in person trying to log in to the Kahoot? It's not there. Three, two, one. All right, here we go. All right, who caught the eventual game winning touchdown in NC State's victory over Clemson on Saturday? Player Thomas, Devin Carter, Emeka Amezi, or Ricky Person Jr.? That one will be slightly easier if you just watched it happen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> shouldn't have been hard in the first place, though. Yep, Devin Carter. Congratulations to almost everyone. <laughs> Which MLB team is currently enjoying a 16-game win streak, the third longest of the century so far? Boston Red Sox, the New York Yankees, the LA Dodgers, or the St. Louis Cardinals? Kind of crazy. Before this, the longest win streak this season was with the A's. I think had 13 in a row. Just were they, were they 13? Dang. That's, that's just impressive. Four away from the money ball streak. Yeah. Really cool. Which NFL kicker won his game with a record-setting 66-yard field goal off the crossbar? Hey, it is in. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a buddy that's the same way. Justin Tucker. The GOAT. Which NHL player was stripped of his captaincy after failing a physical last week? Delete your, delete your franchise. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about Detroit or this NHL team? <laughs> Jack Eichel, spoiler alert, was stripped of his captaincy after he failed a physical. <laughs> Jack Eichel. Like this. <laughs> Saturday was Clemson football's first loss to an ACC team since this team upset the Tigers in 2017. Syracuse. I didn't even know that one before I looked it up. I remember the pit win. I did not remember Syracuse. Which of these franchises has never won an NBA championship? Rip the Hornets, the Hawks, the Blazers, the Sonics, or the Nuggets. I don't know if it's going to be the Sonics. That's close enough. Yeah. Nugs. Tim Beck in the lead. Which rookie quarterback did not throw multiple interceptions in his game <laughs> yesterday? 
they all struggled, but one of them managed to not throw two plus picks. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Fields, <laughs> six for 20, 40 something yards, but uh, zero interception. <laughs> what minor league baseball team finished with the best record in AAA during the regular season? The Jumbo Shrimp, the Biscuits, the Knights, or the Bulls? I'm just getting kids when you're enthusiastic. <laughs> It was the Bulls. Um, the Biscuits are double A, and they lost the championship yesterday, and so I'm still kind of bummed about that. Not going to lie. Yeah, the Bulls are going to get it done. Yeah, Bulls will get it done for the race system, though, so we believe. Oh, uh, it's a whole different conversation. Which of these NFL teams? <laughs> you know, Jake Cronenworth was the Padres. He used to play for the Bulls. Like, I mean, you just got to do what you got to do sometime. Uh, which NFL team has not made a Super Bowl appearance? Riff. All right, last question. Which preseason top 10 team was booted from the 23 point loss to the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. I actually didn't look at this question. <laughs> All answers are everybody correct. gets it right. Everybody take goes pictures, do whatever. Here. All right. Thank you. Great trivia, as usual. Third place, Ian. Second place, Brandon. And in first place, Anthony. Nice job. Nice job. Which one did you miss? Uh, Clemson loss? I think it was the basketball championship. So I, I okay. That's fair. All right. So now that we're done, all right, back to the slides. Back to the boring stuff. Sorry. All right. Someone didn't get the code earlier. So if you're late to the meeting, scan the QR code and we'll sign you in. It'll be about three more seconds. There's a code later too. But all right. Announcements. Number one, Michael Lopez is Zoom calling in this Friday at three. Um, like we, like I said last week, he's discussing his paper with Luke Pins about home field advantage in European soccer during COVID. It's going to be held over Zoom. Link is going to be in the chat of Zoom, or it's going to be in the um, speaker notes of this when we send out the slides. Whether that's tonight or tomorrow, I don't know. I'm kind of busy with homework. But moving along. He's also the sponsor of the Big Data Poll, and the Big Data Poll topic is special teams. That is it. It gives you a bunch of special teams data. Do whatever you want with it, which is kind of different than the past years. So that's really, really unique. Next one, Nessus starts this Friday. It's from 1245 to 230 this week. Uh, you have to sign up today to sign up. It's free, so like, might as well throw in your email and get the Zoom link anyways, even if you don't plan on showing up this week or later this week. That's fine, too. It's a recurring series. It's going to be every Friday during the fall um, this month of October. UConn Sports Analytics Symposium. Their poster contest, if you're entering in that, is due Friday. That's mostly a reminder for myself. I want to be doing my poster. Um, programming tutorials, speakers. The price is $5. Really, really good conference. That's the one I went to last year. I really enjoyed it. The, speaker the speakers and the tutorials are going to be really, really good as well, seeing who's lined up for those. Carnegie Mellon Sports Analytics Conference is November 6th and 7th. There's going to be speakers, poster session. I had the price wrong. It's usually around $20 for students, not $10, unfortunately. But if you need help covering that, you know, we, you can talk to us and we can help you get that sorted out too. Um, website links for all those conferences will be linked in the PowerPoint presentation, as you can kind of see. T-shirts, kind of what they're going to look like. We're still in talks about how much we're, we're going to charge for them. We kind of ballparked it at $10, but well, that might change. Um, so that will be more information about that somewhat soon. Now on to intro tutorial three. This is the least intro with the R that we will probably have because it's not completely with R, but we are going to use R a little bit. So let's go ahead and open a session up. So what are the, what's the package we need if we want to manipulate data? Just call it out. Tidyverse. Yep. So go ahead and. Pop that in there. 
We're plotting. What package do we need? Yep. The ggplot2 package. And lastly, for data this week, we're going to use Layman just because it's easy. So that's, that's our baseball data sets. So we're going to collectively just kind of make a visualization. Kind of, I'm going to introduce a few different things from last week that we kind of didn't go over, but most of it's going to be a review of what we did last week. That's why there was no questions in the Kahoot for that. So to make the pain, you know, kind of like what goes here in the background for our data, what do we need to do? What kind of statement do we start off with? Anybody? Does that look familiar? Is the GZ plot statement. Then you got to use the first argument is your data argument. We're going to use the pitching data set. Actually, we need, we need to clean data first. So this is plotting. We need to clean our data. Sorry. So we're going to make a data called Red Sox. We're going to use Red Sox data um, from the pitching data set. How do I do our pipe symbol? Anybody remember what that kind of looks like? Yep, control shift M is the shortcut. So that's good enough for me. So we're gonna filter and do where the year is 2004. The year variable is called year ID. How do I type that in? Somebody else. Kind of wanna do this all together as a group because next week we're gonna do this pretty much on your own or in smaller groups or pairs for this competition. So that way I know if you guys can tell me what to type, I know that you know what's going on and you're able to do this kind of stuff. Does that make sense to everybody? It's in person. So what, what do I type in? Um, to, to get certain rows where only the Red Sox played. Someone said it earlier, I think. One of them. Yep, filter. We want to filter where year ID something, 2004. If we want it to equal 2004, what do I type? Two equal signs. That's our comparative operator. It says where year ID is exactly 2004. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat if you're on Zoom as well. Um, how do I get it where the team ID is Boston? Team ID equals equals Boston. Would this code work as it is right now? Why not? Yep, Boston needs to be a string because there's no variable in our environment that's called Boston. It needs to be a string. Plus, we want it to match exactly that in quotes, the BOS. So if we look at that, there's our Red Sox data. Look at it, it kind of has our different pitchers um, from their years, from 2004 all the way, oh, just for 2004, sorry, from Boston and kind of how they did during the season. So let's make a box plot. So box plot, our data is Red Sox, To set our X variable, what do we have to do? X variable, what do we do, guys? All right, let's try X equals, and we'll just say team ID. And for our Y variable, it's the same thing. Y equals home runs is what we're going to put it as right now. Okay. So let's run this. And let's look at it. Nothing happened. We got a white square. Does anybody know, including board members, does anybody know why that kind of happened? Kind of look at our code right here. Where are we getting this team ID from? We want to get it from this Red Sox variable, right? But right now what we have is we're looking for team ID in our environment and it's not there because it's not in our environment. It's in our Red Sox data set. So how, what, what, what code do we need to run around this? The AES, yep, got to have it as an aesthetic. So AES, X equals your X variable and then Y equals your Y variable, All right? So now when we look at it, There, now we can see our team ID and our home runs and different kinds of stuff like that. Okay. 
this is the new part for you guys. To make a box plot, you're going to do geom underscore box plot. And that's how you get your box plot for your data. So let's look at it. There's kind of our box plot of how many home runs each of the pitchers gave up during the season. Who here has heard of a violin plot? Anybody? Violin plot. So one of the one of the nice things about box plots is that it's kind of it tells you your minimum, your maximums, and kind of your quartiles in between here. If you're taking the stats class, you probably learned a little bit about that. But what if we want to see like a more accurate description of what this box plot would look like if it was the actual distribution? We can use the violin plot. So to do, to do that, we use geom underscore violin. And it gives it that violin or, um, yeah, violin shape is probably the best way of explaining that kind of shape. I don't want to save it to box plot. I just kind of want to show it. So that's why we're not doing the arrow back to box plot. What we can do, we can have um, violin plot and do it that way. That way we can save it. It didn't print anything new, but it does allow us to like look at it. So let's start changing some of our titles. So we have violin plot. I'm going to add to it, add another layer on. So how what's what's the function that we use to change labels? Somebody remember? labs. All right, so we're going to change the title. What do we want to call this kind of plot? Someone just started a name, not really important. Yep, that's that works for me. Distribution of Red Sox home runs in 2004, right? Specify how we filtered it, specifies what it is, um, actually, we'll just distribution of Red Sox home runs allowed because this is from the pitcher data set. We'll do a subtitle that says Red Sox 2004 World Series season. Oh. Cool. Is that done? What are we missing? Uh, this is probably like, if you don't get anything out of last week, this is caption. Thank you. All right. Caption. Data viz by NCSU SAC. Data from layman package. That looks good. Does anybody else want to make any more changes that we can make to it? Simple, easy. Anything you remember from last week that we didn't do this week that you want to kind of review? Can you try to like set the, the thing on the top, like the middle? Yep. If we want to center the title, we use the theme function. I definitely don't expect you to remember this because I barely remember it sometimes. Plot.title equals element <laughs> underscore text. H just equals 0 0.5. There we go. And I'll center the subtitle and caption as well. There we go. Everything's centered. Do we want to change numbers? Or not numbers, colors? Does that sound fun? If you want to, we can. If you don't, like, we don't have to. All right, I'm getting some head nods, yes. So we're changing colors. Um, so let's do that up here. Actually, yeah, let's do this up here. So color, what color do we want to make it? Red. All right, so use, we'll use color equals red. What that'll do is make the outline red. If we want to make the fill, we want the inside of the violin plot, this is probably the difference where you can see the difference between um, fill and color the best. We're going to choose navy. That's backwards. Let's not do that. 
There you go. You can kind of see the outline is in that navy blue color. And then the fill is kind of that red. Good suggestions. Anything else that you want to change about this? Does that look good? I don't really like the x-axis saying team ID. Um, so we can change that in our lab statement as well. We'll do an empty string, which means it'll just show up nothing. Makes it look it went away. And we'll change our y-axis to home runs allowed. That looks good. That looks shareable, right? If you saw this graphic on Instagram, Twitter, you, you'd say that's, that's pretty cool. So that's kind of what we're going to go over is like, how do we actually need to share this? So let's save our code. I'm going to save it as Red Sox um, plotting. All right. I'm saving it to my desktop. Just that's usually where I save my stuff. You can save it to somewhere where you know how to get your file. All right. So we talked about this a little bit in person. If you're on a Mac, some of the file paths are different. If you're on a Dell, file paths are different. If you're on a PC, a Windows, it's different basically kind of where, how those file structures are set up. Just know how to, for today, you just need to know how to get to the files and where you're getting. It. So let's save our R code um, somewhere to wherever you want on your computer. And then we'll close out. Now we're going to go to this website. This is called GitHub. Has anybody heard of GitHub before? Yes. Okay. What is GitHub for? If, if y'all have heard of it before, what, what do you know about it? If you want to. Uh, yep. Okay. Anybody else? Version control. Version control. Good. Anybody else? To, okay. Yes. That's kind of where, that's kind of where I put my tutorials is. GitHub is like a nice way to put stuff online just like as a big folder so that if I'm on my computer, if I'm on this computer, if I'm on Tyson's computer, if I'm on whoever's computer, I can get to it and the other people can access it and see how you've done stuff at well. So vocabulary words. Um, GitHub is the website. Git is the thing that we're doing. We're getting the code onto GitHub. There's a example of another website that ends in hub. Same principle applies. That's the best way I've heard it explained. So um, this allows coders to collaborate on code without losing fear or without fear of losing a previous version. So like, let's say I made my code and I like royally screwed it up on my computer later on. I can just pull that version from GitHub and we're all good. Uh, words to know, repository. Each one of these is called a repository. It's another word for folder. Uh, all of your files for a project go inside of a repository. So let's make a new repository. That's probably the best thing to do. So to make a new repository, you need to create a, an account on GitHub. Uh, let's go back to the main screen. Create an account. Then we're going to click on our profile picture up here in the top right corner. Then we're going to click your repositories. And we're going to want to make a new one. So we're going to click new. All right. So now we need to name our repository. So I'm going to call it Red Sox um, SAC meeting. As you can see, repositories can't have spaces in them on GitHub. So it automatically just replaces it with a dash. You can change that if you want. Like you can just make it, you know, all together. Red Sox sack meeting. I just like mine with the dashes in it. So that's, that's fine with me. Description. This is a plot about the Red Sox that we made for the 9-27 intro three sack tutorial. You can choose to keep it public, which means anybody can see it on the internet, or you can make it private that only you can see it. Uh, there's a couple of things down here. The important one is add a readme file. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, what that means. Then you're gonna click get create repository. So what that does, 
is that makes a new folder, but like online so that other people can see it. Another reason this is useful if you're collaborating with somebody that, you know, isn't always right next to you, that's great. So like last year, if me and Tyson were working on a project, I was back home in Alabama and he was here somewhat near Raleigh. We couldn't collaborate on code otherwise, besides just sending all the files back and forth, which gets annoying because those files get bigger and bigger, it gets slower and slower emails. So GitHub's just a way to just drop it in there and then he can pull it out on his end. All right, so the next thing we need to do is we want to add files to this, which is really, really easy. So find your file that you made. So the Red Sox plotting and you just drag it and drop it. So then you wanna give your name to your change. So let's say add um, file. You can add an additional description. I didn't feel like I really need to do that here. If it's something simple like that. Commit changes. And then the Red Sox plotting is now in my GitHub repo, repo repository, interchangeable is the shortened way of saying it. So what is this readme file? A readme file is like an explanation of all of your work. So any kind of files you put in there, you should put in there. Any kind of like, let's say you're working on a project, just like a brief explanation of like, what is your project about? That needs to go in there as well. Uh, it's written in markdown text, which we will learn about in a few weeks. So I put the Red Sox plotting.r. It's like, yes, Red Sox plotting.r file. What does this file do? This file plots the 2004 um, home runs allowed by the Red Sox as a violin plot. If I'm going fast, it's okay. The code is, or this little paper I have right here that kind of explains some of what we're going over and a little bit more will be sent out. So don't worry. Don't, I don't, I'd rather you like pay attention than try to type everything in that I'm typing in. So then you can commit the changes again, like we did below. This is something that we did in like five seconds. A better example of this would be one of the repositories I made already. Let's go with this one. So this summer I made graphs for the Olympics. Um, and it kind of has, here's an explanation of what I'm doing. Here's what this fo data sets folder is, or zip file is. Here's what the flags and icon folder is. Kind of spells things out exactly. If you got this folder and got the readme file, you know exactly what everything is and how it kind of works. Does that make sense? Another thing that you can do, it's super important. Let me go back to my... Um, Red Sox repository. Another thing that you can do is called forking, F-O-R-K-I-N-G. Uh, it's useful if you don't want to mess up this current repository. So let's say I'm Tyson's working on a project and I have an idea that kind of offshoots from his. That's when we would learn how to fork. So to fork, we can click right here where it says I'm sorry, we go to the code tab, which is right here. So we already clicked on that. Then we're gonna click the button that says main and we're gonna create a branch by just typing in a new name. So this is um, new branch. And obviously there's no branch called new branch. So we're gonna create it. And so now what we can do is we can change our name of our file. The Red Sox are doo doo. Go Rays. All right. So that's what my version of it looks like. And so this other version, the main version, the original one, is still okay. No one, nothing, nothing has been changed or affected, right? What happens when we want to combine? If we want to combine these, that's available too. So let's go back to our new branch that I called New Branch. We're going to submit what is called a pull request. So this is when the owner of the repository is going to merge your edits to the main branch, which is the one that contains the most current version of the file. So to do this, 
we click on pull request up here, then compare and pull request. Great pull request. All right. So I know these two have no conflicts, which means in the sense of I didn't delete something in the other one that I had in the old version or had in new branch. I didn't delete anything in the, the main branch. So that means we have no conflicts, which means we're good. Majority of the time you should not have any conflicts, which is fine. If you're the owner of the, the main repository, you're the one that makes the pull request, or you're the one that merges the pull request. Does that make sense? I can make a pull request or I can submit a pull request and I can make a branch off of any GitHub, GitHub I want. But I can only merge a pull request if I'm the person that owns the main thing. So merge pull request, confirm it. So now we can look and it says Red Sox Duty, go raise. I don't want that on there. So I can just, you know, just delete it. Does that make sense? Is, I know, what's up? How do I do the new branch thing? How do I create a new branch? How do I, new, how do I create a new branch? So you're on the code tab right here. You click drop down where it says main, it kind of shows you what branch we're on. And you can just type in the new branch name. So we'll call this new branch two. Another thing you can do, let's say like on your computers, I'm not gonna do it on mine, but if you wanna to go to this GitHub branch and make pull request off of it, that's fine with me. Or make branches off of it and submit those as pull requests. That's fine with me if you wanna do that to practice. I'm not sure if I'll merge them or not. It depends on what you're saying, but <laughs> anyways. So like I said, GitHub is really good for collaborating and sharing code back and forth. So for example, I'm just gonna use Tyson again. If he wanted to take this Red Sox code and do something off of it, let's say he wanted to make the colors different, he can just download the code and go with it. So that's actually the end of the tutorial for today, but we have some more stuff to cover. So like we're not done with the meeting. So any questions about GitHub in general? That's some very basic stuff. Uh, oh, this is fun. I forgot this one last thing. What if there's a way we could track, all right, this is where we were at this certain spot in time and keep going kind of like in a timeline format. The way that we can do this, we can click on the insights tab right here and then click network. This is really cool when it loads. All right, so it, it kind of shows you how the process has gone. We started here, September 27th, the initial commit. That was me making the thing. Adding the file was when we added the code in, right? So then we changed our readme file. So what do you think this blue line is right here? Any guesses? Yep, that's our branch. You can literally see it branching off. And then we made a change here in the new branch. We updated the readme. And this is where it got merged back in to the, the main branch. And then finally I updated the readme. So it kind of gives you a brief history. Um, let's look at a, a, probably an older um in the older github this is a package that someone made so we want to look we can go to insights network so he started this package here that's actually a very poor example wow our package GitHub. this is definitely going to be a better one insights network this is the baseball r package i don't know if i mentioned it last week it's still under repair the guy that made it has kind of like got out of, out of out of sync but it's getting back to where it's like actually useful ah perfect so guy so the guy made the package way on back here and then different people have branched off of it and made changes off of this branch and stuff eventually is getting merged back to the branch Eventually, the main branch collapses into this green one, and it kind of gives the timeline of how it's all kind of worked. So it's really, really neat to see the network map of it. Any, any more questions about 
GitHub or the plotting that we did before we kind of move on from our tutorial part of today? No? Any questions on Zoom? Feel free to type in the chat. I'll give you guys another second to do that. Okay, cool. Questions, like I said, sign in form. If you haven't signed in, feel free to do that. Last call for that. Moving on. We got something important coming up next week. We have a competition with Villanova. So this is a competition that we set up over the summer. We have a mystery data set. Kind of the premise of this is you have one hour to make some kind of data visualization with a data set that's going to be brand new that we're going to introduce it to you right now. This is a hockey net. So it's a hockey data set. We want to pick a sport that like people some, know somewhat about, but like have never seen the data before. And there's not really two people that have a huge advantage that know a ton of hockey, especially women's hockey. So we're using the PWHPA, the Professional Women's Hockey um, Players Association. They have this big conference for data analytics. Uh, happened during the summer last year. Hopefully they'll get to do it again. Um, this data is from Sports Logic. Um, Carly, Carly Markey, she goes to Carnegie Mellon. She helped me find this data. She's one of the people that organized the conference. And the judge, I just checked in with her, should be Aly Alyssa Longmuir. Uh, she was also one of the people that helped do that conference. So we're going to kind of go over what that data is, how you can get to your computer, and like just kind of some general ideas on kind of how to where to go with this, because this is probably the biggest data set that you guys have worked with excluding layman, because that's kind of spread out over multiple data sets. So it is on the GitHub for PAC Sports Analytics. So if you want to go to this website and pull it up, that's fine. I will actually put that in the chat because that would be easier for those. You can also just Google PAC Sports Analytics GitHub, and it should be like the first thing that pops up on Google. And then you can navigate to the GitHub repo from there. So to download this to your computer, you click right here where it says code, that green button, then download zip file. Should download it to your computer. You open it up. You need to make sure it is unzipped. So if it is a .zip file on your computer, you will not be able to open it in R. Fair warning, we've already had enough issues with file paths, so I need to make that one explicit. So let's look at it. We're going to look at the clean PWHPA secret dream tour or secret, secret green ugh, secret dream gap tour dot CSV. I'm going to open it in R because I just like seeing stuff in R better. Um, Oh, dang it. I'm not dealing with that today. Almost there. So we need to library tidyverse because I don't have that in this session. Read underscore CSV, the name of that file. Dot CSV. Ah, dang it. Um, data. There we go. Finally got the data open. All right, 416 observations from the 2021 season. And there's like 
50 plus variables. See how many it says? 51 variables, right? So we're gonna kind of go over what every single one of these is, just so that if you're not a hockey person like me, you know what it means. This is also right here in the GitHub for next week, in case you forget within a week and a half, because we're not meeting on Monday. We're meeting on Wednesday next week because of fall break. So that's a normal change. It will be in person, yes. Do we have like, can we like mess around with it like after we go home? Yes, feel free to mess around with it, but like don't come in with a graph already made. If that makes, like you can make a graph, but like don't let that be the one you're competing with because that's kind of like cheating. Okay. And we're not UNC, so. <laughs> What's up? Yeah. So the one that we're like uh, using for competition, we have to be in here. You have to do in here. So that includes people on Zoom. We're going to meet like completely in person, like no online Zoom meeting next week at all on Wednesday. Wednesday, not Monday because of fall break. Any any questions about that part of it, logistics wise? All right, cool. So going over the variables in this data set. Result is the result of the of the game that we're talking about. So as you can tell, we can use the unique function to look at unique stuff. Data dot result. There's only two options, wins and losses. So that's what that represents. Did the team win or lose? This is goals for and goals against in the match. This is your date. Just a heads up, the USA is weird. So everywhere else in the world goes day, month, year because it's from smallest to biggest. So that's how that date works. This is February 27th, 2021. Game ID. So what this represents is that each individual game has a unique game ID. So going to our next few variables, Minnesota is the team and New, New Hampshire is the opponent. No, that's not New Hampshire. I don't remember. I think it is. Anyways, Minnesota versus New Hampshire. So that exact game on February 27th is game ID 46181. The game on the 28th is 46182. So referring back to something that we made a few months ago, or not a few months ago, a few weeks ago, that you would use the group by function if you wanted to combine by games. Same thing for by player. You could, you could use um, group by player name. Position is what position on the ice they play. You're also limited here as well. Data dot position. There's only defensemen and forwards in this data set. That's because women's hockey is six on six, which is, I believe, different than regular hockey. Yes. Yes, I believe it does include, or no, it's, I think it's a smaller number. It may be, I don't remember exactly the number. That's because I'm not a hockey person. I'm so sorry. But yeah, it's like a it's like a reduced number of people on the ice. TOI time on ice. G is goals scored. ID is individual expected goals created. Um, assist is assist. Hockey people will explain this better than I do. Primary assist is your pass to the person that scores the goal. Secondary assist is the pass to the primary assist. The pass to the passer to the shooter, to the goal. Does that sound about right? Okay. Um, shots, number of shots taken. Slot shots, if you're like me and don't have any idea what that means, don't worry about it, just don't use it. If you do know what it means, use it. Or don't, you know, just make your own graphic. <laughs> Rush chances, those would be like fast breaks in basketball. So like if you have a three on two, that's the situation we're talking about there. Cycle chances, there's an explanation here, but if you don't know it, don't use it. Four check chances, um, same exact thing. Rebound chances is number of chances to get a rebound. That works exactly the same way in basketball as well. Offensive zone pass attempts. I don't, I can draw that. Hold a second. Left screen off. So your hockey. Your link is kind of like this big oval. You'll have your lines. That's that's usually the blue line. That's a blue line. Then like here's here's like your middle. So if the goal we're trying to score on is like here, this is your offensive zone. This is your neutral zone. 
an issue in the defensive zone, right? So score here. Defend here. Uh, Mas, yes, we should still, yeah. Where are we? Successful offensive zone passes are the ones that are successful and go into that offensive zone. Can everybody on like that side like somewhat see that? Okay, cool. Slot pass completions. Slot passes are certain how to pass. Stretch passes, same principle. If you don't really know it, don't really use it. Controlled exits and injuries are when you – controlled exits are when you have the puck and you're leaving the defensive zone. So you have control of it. Controlled entries is the same thing, but you're going into the offensive zone. OZ time of possession is your time of possession in the offensive zone. Most of the other variables is now explainable. Percent of play in the offensive zone, percent of play in the defensive zone. As you can see, those should be converses of each other or somewhat. So let's add these two numbers up. 0 0.382. Plus 0.415. That leaves about 0 0.203 left that you're in the neutral zone for the entire game. Overall contested LPR. Is that LPR? Uh, late, yeah, that's LPR. Latency, something, recovery rate. So that's how often a defender recovers to stop a shot from reaching the goal. So, for example, if LeBron was doing that chase down that chase down block like he had in game seven of that series against the Warriors. That's what that is. Player goals against most of these from variable 35 on are like the opposite. How many much, how much the team got. Uh, so like how many, how many player goals did that person allow? How many shot attempts did that person allow? How many shots on goal did that person allow? Et cetera. Any questions about the data? Do you want to see an example graph? Yes. Okay. Cool. I made one of those. So I read in the data, or I sent my working directory and I read in the data. So here is our CSV file. I'm only going to select a certain number of variables because I don't want this whole huge data set and have to scroll through. You use the select function to cert, pick the certain columns that I want. So I wanted the player, the position, the team, and all variables that contain the phrase OZ pass. So that's OZ pass and OZ pass against. You can type them both out. That's totally fine too. This is probably the, the most important step. I want to group by player. So that I can tell, all right, this player is doing this certain thing across all games for the entire season. Then I use the summarize function. We went over that in intro two. So team, unique team, because most player only played for one, maybe two teams if they got traded during the middle of the season. Position, unique position, they only play one position. Offensive zone pass attempts against. I wanted to add those up for the entire season per player, which is why we group. Successful ones, I want to do the same thing. I wanted to sum those as well. If you group, you need to ungroup. Then I made a percent. I said, all right, what is the successful ones? Versus, successful ones against this player versus the ones that the opponents attempted against this player. I filtered the only to be defensive players and where the attempts are greater than or equal to 200. Just kind of made my graph a little bit nicer. Any questions on what I did to manipulate that data? Feel free to ask. I know I kind of went that, through that fast. So we haven't reviewed it. Anybody? What's up? If you ever do anything in groups, you need to. You just kind of have to ungroup. That's it's kind of the general statement. Because if I didn't have this ungroup, it would like try to do percents while inside of this group, which gets kind of messy with your data frame later on. It's if you are going to group and ungroup, which for this you probably will need to, it's easily easier to just group by, do your summarized statement here, and then immediately ungroup afterwards. 
next week I won't be participating in the competition. I'm just going to be walking around helping. So if you run into an issue like that, just, hey, I'm stuck. And then I'll come and maybe some other people walking around helping out too. So with that being said, did all that kind of stuff and say that in a data frame called defensive players. So it has all the defensive players in the data set grouped together, all good with the variables that we requested. Requested. Next, I made a data frame called colors. This is also in the GitHub so that you don't have to look these up. It is right here, PWHPDA team colors. We're gonna join these two together by using the left underscore join statement. We went over something similar called the merge statement. You are more than welcome to use that as well. That's why I also have with the by, you can combine by team. So now for the plotting part. All right, so this, this should look familiar. We used the full data data set, which is what I just call that one where I join those colors and the normal data together. Pipe head 10 means it takes the first 10 columns. So let's just look at this data for a second. Feel free to do this like outside of the ggplot statement as well. You could do um, top 10 equals, actually, I'm just gonna do this. That's a great idea. Full data, head 10. And what it does, it takes the top 10 defensemen, just defense women, and ranks them by, or it has just them in general. Sound good? Actually, I bet I screwed that up. Rip. You can arrange by percent. Sending. Sorry about that. Probably changing my graph a little bit. So full data, we're going to take the percent column. We want to arrange it descending. So who had the highest percent at the top all the way down. And then we're going to just cut and take the top 10 rows of it. Let's see if that changes anything. It, I think it did. I don't remember. So now we have our top 10 data set. We have our data's top 10. Ignore this now. Our X, we're going to just call it player because we want to break up by player. Theme underscore dark is something I haven't learned, but what it does, it, it makes the whole like theme of the plot dark, which is nice. Then bar plots. So for we had, we're, what I want to do, I just wanted two bar plots kind of like on top of each other, kind of layered like this. So that you can see the successful ones versus like the whole entire thing. Does that idea make sense to everyone? So I have our AES statement because these are stuff inside of our top 10 data set. And then we wanted the attempts against these attempts. We want the fill to be primary, which is one of the colors that we have listed. And then stat equals identity. So let's just look at this right now. So our, prim our names are on the x-axis. Attempts against are on the y-axis. Our bars are kind of lined up. So the next line is the same exact thing. You just add the extra bar on top of it to be the successful ones against. And that kind of looks like that. Does that make sense? Kind of how we're progressing through it. The next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to put labels at the end of each of these bars so that you can see what the actual percent was. And then I kind of adjusted it with numbers here is I said, all right, we want this to be 20 pass attempts less than like the max, just, just kind of like a, a location wise. All right. Scale fill identity allows you to use um, this as your actual color, like the actual hex code that I have put in there for you. So that's why I use the scale fill identity. I'll have that code on the board because that's kind of confusing. Boom, all of a sudden it's actually the colors of the teams that they play for, which is useful, right? This is Mexi. You can't read anybody's name. So I did chord flip. What that does is it takes your graph from here to here, which looks much nicer. <clears throat> to end the stuff you know, your labs, 
Oh, I forgot. I put the plus sign. Rip. We have our title, our caption, our captions. Or I'm sorry, our subtitle, our captions. Changes our X's and Y players. And then finally, we adjust it. There we go. And that's our plot. That's kind of the plot I made. It took me probably a little bit more than an hour to make this because I had to search for the colors, which you guys don't have to do anymore. So again, feel free to just download, as Jordan asked, you can feel free to download the, the, the data and, and try with it, especially over fall break if you're not doing anything. You might as well. Here's the data you're going to be doing it with. Go with it. But then for the actual competition, use the data. Brands making new as you get it in here. Any questions at all, feel free to come up. That's going to be the end of our Zoom and the meeting since it's 8 o'clock. And I will see you guys on Wednesday in person because no virtual options. See y'all. Hey.